I'm Amanda Collins. I'm a private citizen representing myself and my family. Thank you for being here. Uh, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, I just want to thank you for giving me time today to listen about how important this it is that campus carry not be repealed in Colorado. Also, I'd be very grateful if you would please indulge me this evening by first thinking of a young woman whom you love dearly. Listen and imagine her telling you this story. On a typical Monday evening, the only thing that seemed to be different was the midterm awaiting me at my class on the university campus. At 10 p.m., I walked to the parking garage with a group of colleagues in an attempt to ensure my safety. I parked in this particular parking garage because it was very close to where my class was. And logically, parking closer to where your class is instead of off-campus parking is safer than having to walk across campus at night. As I approached the parking garage, I was the only one who had parked on the ground floor. Seeing no visible threat between me and my vehicle, I wished everyone a good week and broke off from the group. Approaching my vehicle at an angle, what I didn't see was the man hunched down by the wheel well of a truck next to a sedan. As I passed him, he grabbed from behind, forced me down to the cold, hard asphalt, placed a pistol to my temple, clicked off the safety, told me not to say anything, and then he began to brutally rape me. As I lay there defenseless, straddled by a man much larger than me, I felt every vertebrae in my back being slammed into the asphalt that felt like gravel. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see university police parkers, sorry, I could see the university police cruisers parked across the way. And in that same moment, I knew that the university police office had already closed and no one was coming for me. While my body was being ripped apart as this man raped me, I could see in his eyes that he had the propensity to kill. With my life hanging by the thread of a trigger pull, I wondered if this is how I was gonna spend the last moments of my life before I meet my maker. And if I'm being completely honest, a part of me was hoping that I was on my way to meet Jesus. Because actually living after surviving such a horrible crime seemed impossible. It just took me about a minute and a half to describe my attack to you. In reality, it took eight minutes. That's what I lived through on October 22nd, 2007, on the University of Nevada, Reno campus. The terror I felt in those moments continued to haunt me for the next 13 months while my attacker remained at large in ways that only other rape survivors can understand. In November 2008, the man who raped me was captured by the Reno Police Department and the face that haunted my nightmares had a name, James Bila. Mr. Bila would later be convicted in district court for not only raping me at gunpoint, but also kidnapping and raping another woman, as well as for the rape and murder of Brianna Dennison. Jeez. On October 22nd, 2007, my right to say no was taken away from me by both James Bila and the Nevada legislation that has decided there should be an arbitrary line where the university campuses begin. This arbitrary line declares campuses a gun-free zone, rendering me and every other law-abiding citizen defenseless. At the time of my attack, I had obtained my concealed carry weapons permit. However, being a law-abiding citizen, I left my permitted weapon at home, and the very law that was meant to ensure my safety guaranteed James Bila an unmatched victim. Even with the 10 years of martial arts training I had received in Taekwondo as a second degree black belt, the harsh reality as a woman is that a firearm is the one equalizing factor when met against an opponent much larger than me. The question of my life is and will remain to be, what would have been different if I had been able to carry my firearm that night? It is a question that continually keeps me up at night as I replay the worst eight minutes of my life. Over and over again with several different possibilities. However, one end result remains. At some point, 
I would have been able to stop my attack and consequently two other known rapes would have never happened and Brianna Dennison would still be alive today. During the past couple of several years, I have heard several options suggested. Call boxes. <clears throat> now please think realistically about how effective they are. A woman in danger, in danger will first have to locate one that works, push a button, wait for a response, explain what's going on, all while fighting off her attacker, then wait for help to arrive. Average national response time is 11 minutes. My entire attack took eight. Furthermore, a call box located above my head as Mr. Bila straddled me on the ground would have been no more help to me than the police were that night. I was raped less than 100 feet away from the campus police office on the same floor where they parked their cruisers. My case is a perfect example that despite law enforcement's best efforts to ensure our safety, they are unable to be everywhere at once. Rape whistles are another suggestion that has been made. In this noise saturated culture we live in, how effective do you think that will be? During my attack, no one was around to respond to me blowing a whistle. And how safely could I have used a whistle with a pistol pointed to my temple. The choice to participate in one's own self-defense should be left to the individual. The individual choice should not be mandated by the government. And we as law-abiding citizens should not have to hand over our safety to another individual. If the government is going to deny law-abiding men and women the choice to participate in their own self-defense, then it assumes the responsibility of protecting the individual. And I know from my own experience and knowledge that despite the university's best efforts, the university has failed miserably in undertaking this responsibility. As I'm talking to you today, I'd like you to consider that most rapes go unreported, as did mine initially. And while I'm talking about one incident involving two other cases, we have no way of knowing just how many assaults actually occur on university campuses. If the purpose of declaring a gun-free zone is to ensure the safety of those on university property in Colorado, then it will not serve that objective. I obeyed the law and left my firearm at home in order to avoid possible expulsion, expulsion from school, losing my CCW permit and possible jail time. My education and CCW permit were valuable to me only when I encountered James Bila, who was neither a student nor a CCW permit holder but intent on committing rape while using a gun. Forfeiting his non-existent education and CCW permit would not have served as a deter did not serve as a deterrent to him. Furthermore, during his sen sentencing, he received a one-year enhancement charge for using a deadly weapon while raping me in a gun-free zone. Soon, what I described to you earlier will fade into your memory, and you probably won't think about it again. But I can't pray it away. I live every day with the implications, being a survivor of rape, and what they have on my life, which I cannot go into because of time constraints. And as I live with the memory, <coughs> excuse me, weighted with the question of my life, what would have been different if I had been carrying the weapon I was licensed to carry that night? I would ask, I would like to leave you with a question. How does rendering me defenseless protect you against a violent crime? <laughs>